Good afternoon, uh, Speaker, Chairperson, Deputy Speaker, our Secretary to Parliament, the executive that is with us today, as well as members of the media that have joined this uh, uh, media briefing this afternoon. You are all welcome. My name is Manelisi Wolela. I'm currently Acting Divisional Manager for Communications. Uh, thank you so much for coming and keeping the rest of South Africans uh, informed throughout. We have a special pleasure today because we have our two POs, presiding officers, available to interface with you and give you a picture of where we're sitting and where we're going. Without any further ado, I'm going to request the Speaker of the National Assembly, Honorable Mamubaleka Mbete, to present to you a brief overview and after which we will then entertain your questions. Thank you so much. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Olela. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the media, and welcome, especially because I think this is our first media briefing as presiding officers uh, in 2017. We thought it would be good just to come and give you directly from ourselves as presiding officers a, a state of readiness account. Uh, broadly to say we are indeed ready to run a successful uh, orderly state of the nation address <coughs> event tomorrow evening. We, we have observed that there are great levels of enthusiasm among many guests who are coming from all over the country, different sectors uh, and uh, organs of state. We also have international guests, including His Excellency Dang, who is the president of the Pan-African Parliament. We have a, a top executive of the World Bank, who's one of our guests. We also have our usual special guests, former President Thabo Mbeki and his wife, former chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, and of course the mayor of Cape Town, premiers for all, from all provinces, speakers. And we have people coming from the constitution-making process of 20 years ago. As you are aware, we, we are also marking 20 years of the constitution this year. We, of course, have our usual non-governmental organizations, labor unions, faith-based organizations, <coughs> academia, and traditional leaders as part of our guests. The theme, as you would expect, is celebrating 20 years of the Constitution and the National Council of Provinces. So the 2017 SONA takes place in this context. It's of course, as you know, but of course we can never say this enough, a very important day in the calendar. For us, the single most important day because it is when we bring under the same roof people from different uh, arms of the state, but also different sectors of society, ordinary South Africans, and also South Africans that are working formally for the state and government in particular. And we all listen to the account uh, that is given by the head of state in terms of what would have gone on in the previous 12 months. I think we have to say that e this day tomorrow will mark the beginning of a substantive parliamentary program for 2017. We will have uh, our own colleagues with whom we had a special meeting yesterday and that is the speakers of the nine provincial legislatures. 
the 2017 SONA will be the 10th <coughs> by President Jacob Zuma in his capacity as head of state. And among things he will reflect on, he will table a program of action for the year and account for progress made since the previous commitments in February 2016. So we really are just here to say to you, we, ha we have satisfied ourselves having received reports from the secretary and his team uh, about the state of readiness. We are satisfied that all measures have been taken to make sure that we run a successful event on the 9th of February, uh, which will be an official and formal beginning to what will probably be one of the most exciting years for us as South Africans. So it's all systems go. And uh, we've done as thorough a briefing, a, a planning as we could do. We know that there's been a, a bit of excitement about one or two matters, including issues relating to the deployment of the South African National Defense Force. We hope that you will have by now seen our statement that was attempting to clarify and uh, make sure there's no confusion about members of the Defense Force, that we are not going to see many or hundreds of uh, Defense Force members milling around the precincts of Parliament, no. Those people will not be anywhere around Parliament, and uh, they simply are allowed to be wherever they ought to be as, as soldiers in places we never really are worried or even conscious of as Parliament, because where we focus is the events within the precinct within the house. So where they will be, we don't know. We are not really involved in those issues. So the impression that had earlier been created that they would be descending on parliament, we wish to clarify, is really a wrong impression. Uh, so I think with those introductory remarks, uh, that is our account and our report, and we are ready, if you so wish, to entertain questions of clarification from members of the media. Thank you very much. Unless my colleagues would like to add something. Not you. You. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Uh, let's open the platform for members of the media to raise questions. Noted, yes. Can you hear me now? Thanks, um, Madam Speaker. It's Gay Davis from Eyewitness News. I just wanted to ask whether the Speaker and the Chairperson of the NCOP were aware um, or made aware by the President or the Presidency um, of the deployment uh, of the 441 soldiers. I understand that they won't be deployed in the, within the precinct, but they'll be deployed um, outside. Um, it is a much larger number than has been deployed before. And um, have you been able to get clarity on the, on the uh, information from the presidency which said that they would be used to maintain law and order in cooperation with the SAPS when previously the employment has always just referred to cooperation with the SAPS? So it was the first time that we saw the words law and order 
and the maintenance of it being referred to, which might have contributed to things. Uh, thanks. I'll leave it there for now. Um, good afternoon, Marianne Merton, Daily Maverick. Um, in connection with the statement that the ANC's uh, ZZ Kotwa put out in your name as ANC chairperson, a national chairperson, um, the speaker's ball, uh, you are quoted in that statement to say that this is a private matter. Uh, can you confirm that you yourself will be paying for it? Um, if not, uh, who is paying for it? Are there sponsors? Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, and uh, Jeanette? Hi, Madam Speaker. Janet Heard from Media24. Um, two, two issues. The one is the, the, one of the other issues that have been burning besides the SA and DF has been the issue of media restrictions. So sorry to raise this again, once again. It's been the issue since the first briefing that has been held. And still we feel that we haven't really sort of been going around in circles, to put it mildly. Um, can you just give us a feedback? In fact, this is actually addressed to the Secretary, Mr. Mkitlana. He said he would report back to us about feedback from the police with regard to the discussions that took place yesterday with the PGA and a member of SANEF, myself actually, for full disclosure. So we're just interested what has developed there with those issues and besides the other issues. Um, so, you know, we're obviously very curious to see what the outcome of all that is, um, seeing as SONA is, is happening tomorrow. Um, yeah, that, that, that is my main question at the moment, but if you could also just comment on what you see as unfair or, or freedom of movement for journalists tomorrow. Thank you. In light of the discussions with the security units. Bye. Okay. We, we will take the last one, Kogi, and then go for answers from our leadership. Okay. My name is Budelani from SABC. I just want to get a sense from you, Speaker, whether, you know, given the history of the sittings of the House when the President comes, one, are you anticipating any similar incidents that we've seen in the past tomorrow? And secondly, what kind of measures uh, are there in place if those eventualities do, do take place? Thanks. We will have uh, the first round of answers from our leadership, and after that, we'll take another round. Over to you, POs. My first response is to, I will start with the media and the secretary will add there. <clears throat> as far as we are concerned, uh, uh, the media will be allowed freedom of movement, as is usually the case. Uh, uh, the secretary would have met, as we understand, to clarify this question of restrictions and so on, because the idea is that we we expect that the media be allowed to continue to operate in the manner in which they have operated before. And uh, uh, the other is that uh, uh, the president uh, made a uh, responded to a request by the police uh, and can only deploy on, request, on being requested by the police to support them in case they need any help. And so he has, on receiving such request, to notify parliament if he agrees with the police. And having received that notification, uh, <clears throat> that has been, as is required by the law, uh, uh, AT seat uh, presented in the announcement tablings in Parliament so that every mem Parliament itself is notified, its members have it on record that this is the reason given by the President to do that, that he is requested by the police to support them uh, in uh, 
to use a, a phrase that has created a lot of uh, problems, law and order, meaning basically maintaining support in the event, uh, given the nature of things that might be happening around, uh, outside and so on, uh, so that uh, Parliament knows he does that. Now, this is what, as a <coughs> one of you said, that it's not the first time. So that's the notification we received, and it's been tabled because uh, we, we can't not do that. We have to uh, notify parliament, members of parliament, in fact, uh, once we receive such a notice from the, uh, from the president. The other mem is yours. Are we anticipating any, um, that was the question from Bulilen, um, <coughs> any out of the way behavior and what are the measures? Did I capture your question well? Well, we are hoping that uh, tomorrow's proceedings will go according to plan. We have, however, been getting notice via the media that the president will be interrupted. We do have the rules of procedure that we will follow. We are hoping that all members of parliament will remember and respect the rules and that it will not require us to take any extraordinary measures against members. However, those of us who will be presiding tomorrow are determined that the business of the House of the Joint Sitting will start and finish. That's as far as I can take it, Speaker. Uh, thank you very much for the questions. I do confirm uh, what the colleagues have said, uh, both the deputy speaker and the chairperson, on the questions that they've responded to. And the only question, therefore, that remains for me to address relates to the speaker's ball, and I will be very simple and direct it is not the first time that we are having this speaker's ball. It is indeed a private matter. It does not uh, utilize a single cent from parliament. If you will remember, I think we started not to have dinner paid for by parliament uh, in recent years. And so room opened up for other ways of spending time with colleagues and friends and guests. Hence, the speaker's ball started to, to move into the space. And indeed, it is a private, uh, privately arranged event. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take an, another round. Uh, I've noted you, number two. Any other one, Jeanette? And yeah, four questions. Any fifth one, person? Okay, okay. Let's go in that order. Thanks. Thank you, Speaker. Babalo here from the Sunday Times. Um, last, towards the end of last year, President Zuma said inside the chamber that you um, or the presiding officers were not doing enough to protect him um, from abuse. Um, will you ensure this year that the president will not have any reason to make such a statement? Will he be adequately protected? from whatever disruptions that 
or abuse that he was referring to. In 2000, and just secondly, um, that's the first question, speaker. Just in 2013, the, there were 168 um, SANDF members deployed or employed. I'm not sure what the correct terminology is. In 2015, 188, so it was 20 more. This year, it's 441 almost tripled in number since this current parliament that we are in. Um, is there any reason for that increase in number? We understand the ceremonial duties that the SANDF provides. They line the streets and they play the brass band. Play That we all know um, because the chief whip of the ANC told us earlier now today that the wording in that letter from the president is the problem. That what that's what's problematic, and is basically leading to all of this law and order. In previous years, that that wording was not used. In fact, last year there's no ATC record of deployment or employment of Sandaf members. We've looked; we can't find it. I've only got these years that I've quoted now. What's the difference this time around, Speaker, that we need such a bigger number of, and the wording in that statement that seems to have bothered the ANC chief whip? He wants it corrected, actually. Is, is that worth something that is worth your consideration, or can it be corrected to allay fears, you know, the media and whatever, whoever else is concerned? Thank you. Let's take it to Lulama. Lula Mamaja, SABC. Uh, speaker, when you hear that, it's a follow-up actually on the uh, deployment of these 441 uh, Santaf members. When you hear that um, so many soldiers are going to be deployed, doesn't that, that concerns you? Uh, because uh, even if they are deployed outside parliamentary precinct, the day is about SONA and uh, it's about opening of parliament. Aren't you concerned when you hear um, those deployments? And secondly, has there ever been, has there ever been a situation whereby um, you feel as the presiding officers of parliament that there's lawlessness and an order that is happening when uh, during SONA? And, and thirdly, um, if you can just respond on allegations made by, if there are allegations made by EFF saying that um, they have written to you asking you that tom tomorrow shouldn't be about the state of the nation address. It should rather be a discussion on our parliament um, has, de has, has, has defied the constitution. Has there been any letter from them on writing to you saying that tomorrow shouldn't be about SONA but about parliament discussing how they are defying the constitution? Okay, then we go to Jeanette. Thanks. Um, I'm going back to the, the media issue. I would like to know what, uh, we've got the guidelines now. Um, you mentioned that media, only, only accredited media are allowed to go into designated areas. There's also a map. Can you just put, spell out exactly what that designated area is. And secondly, if I would like to know on a very practical level, say I am confronted by a member of a security unit, bearing in mind you've said we have freedom of movement, etc. what do we do in an event tomorrow that we get stymied by someone who tries to block us and tell us to pull back and not go into a certain area or blocks us. What, well, what is a plan of action that we can do to get a surety from Parliament, bearing in mind what has been said here over and over again, assuring us? What, the practicality on the ground is often very different because security officers do their own thing. So we need to know that Parliament has our backs here and will support us. Thank you. Hello, Jan Gerber, Media24. Um, I also have a question on the army issue. Um, as presiding officers of Parliament, are you satisfied that the question of um, the separation of powers have not been breached by, by the Parliament ordering um, the deployment of the SNDF? 
and also as the presiding officers of what should be the um, people's parliament. How do you feel that it's necessary to employ the army? I mean, what message does it send out to the, to the people of South Africa? Thanks. Hi, just a quick follow-up. I really just wanted to know whether the speaker is paying out of her own pockets for the speaker's ball or whether sponsors have been organized. On the other level, in, in line with previous questions, um, the presiding officers by law are the authority of everything in the parliamentary precinct. And I think it's clause four that says the presiding officers must give express authority for security services to be anywhere in the precinct. The one exception, of course, being a life-threatening situation. Would the presiding officers please confirm the numbers of SAPS, SANDF, state security agents, and any other member of the security forces that you have given permission to be on the parliamentary precinct tomorrow? Thank you. That the, now we have, can, can we take another round? Because I think there's quite a lot of questions that have been raised already. We'll come back to you, Paul and Gay. Thanks. Can I just raise something that uh, the, the purpose of today's media conference is to look at the state of preparedness for tomorrow. And there are other mechanisms for managing issues that are at the personal level affecting some of our leaders. And therefore, may I request that we refrain from engaging those. Otherwise, there are media liaison officers and ourselves who can facilitate that outside of this formal media conference. Thank you. Over to you. Test. I want to get to the, uh, I think it's Babalu's question, whether the POs were doing enough to protect the president after he complained. When we preside, we are guided by the rules which are agreed to by both houses and the joint houses, which protects equally all the members in the house equally. In other words, if a member uses language unbecoming, it does not matter who it is, we will call that me me member to order. If any conduct is unbecoming, we will deal with that behavior, irrespective of who it is. So using these rules of the houses, we protect the president in as much as we protect the backbencher. So I do think that we have done what we could under the circumstances to do what the rules of the two houses and the joint house uh, permit us to do. But you will also be aware that um, the National Assembly has had to revisit um, the, their rules. We are doing the same. Because some of the things which started occurring in Parliament, um, we had never had uh, the disruptions that we started experiencing since 2014 in Parliament. So our rules had not anticipated certain behaviors. And that is why we have had to come back to reviewing the whole issue about the decorum of the houses and taking measures to protect the houses and its integrity. You also looked, you are also saying that since 2013, the numbers have been increasing. It is true, 2013, 168, a, two years later, 188, um, and then in 2017, 441. You say that the wedding is different. In fact, if you look at the wedding of the 2013, it refers to, to combat crime and maintain and preserve the law. In 2017, it says to maintain law and order. If you are in the security sector, that you would know that, in fact, if, if you simplify the language, they mean exactly the same thing. Now, 
the president is required when he deploys to inform parliament, whether they come to parliament or they don't come to parliament, is required by the law to inform parliament because parliament does have a say in how the members of the Defense Force of South Africa are deployed. And that is why he does it. The fact that this year there is 441, parliament cannot explain the difference between why he chose in 2013 to deploy 168 and now 441. Earlier on in our meeting with uh, the whips of the chief whips of different parties, we undertook to find out why the numbers have grown, because we ourselves cannot explain. We do not want to speculate and give reasons for things that tomorrow you will say we misled you on. Um, you say that are we not worried that um, the separation of powers has been breached? No, we're not. Because we have said that any use of any authority within the precincts of parliament will be under, direct, under the direction of the Speaker of the National Assembly and the Chairperson of the NCOP. So far, we have not given any any instruction for police to run amok in the precinct of parliament. We have not given any instruction for members of, uh, what is that element? The, 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 the defense and there's the, another one, SSA. We have not given any instruction. Now, if you are referring to the preparatory meetings that usually take place as we prepare for the State of the Nation address annually, yes, we have been quite open about the fact that when we prepare for the State of the Nation, when we prepare to host any head of state, foreign head of state, when we prepare for any extraordinary measure, that all the the, those agents, the military, the police, and the Secret Service might be under one roof to make sure that nothing goes wrong. That does not mean that we brook or we encourage any breach of the separation of powers. So tomorrow, if and when we need to bring any of the state security it will be under the direction of either or both of us asking for and giving the instruction. It would be a different matter if you said we will sit back and allow the minister of police or the, the president to then run the precinct of parliament. We don't think that will happen. So we, do, we are not worried at all about any breach of the separation of powers. We guard it jealously. We want to maintain the people's parliament. We also want to ensure that the rights of the communities and the private citizens are respected to come to parliament, to bring their issues, and therefore we will continue to guard that space very jealously. Um, the, the program of parliament is agreed to and organized by, uh, via the chief whips forum and to the programming. So the day is decided collectively uh, and, and organized that way. So a request from any one party to change the program requires it to be done in the programming committee and debated there. And if uh, this one has been finalized, uh, tomorrow's purpose is not to discuss the program. That's a programming question. So it will be irrelevant uh, in the first place and not appropriate to raise it there because the, the reason for tomorrow's uh, meeting is expressly communicated to all the parties 
who agreed to it anyway. They may uh, not have agreed to it, but the important thing is that the decisions of the House and its program are agreed to by the majority of the political parties in the House, which has happened in this instance. Uh, so that's, that would be my response to that issue, that please let's remember that it is the majority of political parties who decides the program. And the State of the Nation Address Day itself is not a day to debate programming, uh, quite frankly. And so I would imagine that they would have received that response. But I also want to add to the question of the separation. Can I interject on that? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. I think the, the, the role of the president must be understood on the state of the nation. Mm. He does not just play the role of being the head of the executive on that day. The state of the nation address is called in his capacity as the head of state. In other words, the head of all the three arms of the state, which is why all of us gather under one roof. It is also an account he gives to the whole nation on what he has said in the past and on what he undertakes. He writes to us. I do not think, in fact, there is provision to either the speaker or the chairperson of the NCOP to say, no, we don't think we want the state of the nation. It is an imperative. We agree on the date. I want to emphasize, it is his agenda. We agree that there is no other item on the agenda of that day but the address of the president. So it would be inappropriate for any member to change that. And I just wanted to say that Deputy Speaker is right. Any other matter is a subject of the programming in both houses. And members in the different houses can go to the programming. Now, the state of the nation can also not be bogged down by the issues which are raised by the National Assembly. Because they're not sitting alone. We, the National Council of Provinces, are also there. It's a joint sitting and therefore cannot be reduced to the <coughs> issues which apply only to one house. Mm. And therefore, that would be, again, another point where the other house that comes in would say, uh-uh, don't bog us down. When you are left alone, National Assembly, you can sort your stories out. But at the joint sitting, we want the state of the nation address. Um, thanks, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. I think that was appropriate. The, constitutions, uh, the Constitution speaks of the uh, interdependence, uh, interconnectedness of the different spheres of government. But the same principle applies to the three different arms. That, uh, and this is why it also talks of cooperative governance. So in events such as the one we're talking about, this is one of the examples during which uh, all parts of the state comes together in a practical expression of that uh, interdependency, interconnectedness, yet the distinctness of the various parts uh, of the state. And so even in its planning, uh, execution, and follow-up, the same cooperative uh, relations are expected. And so this is what happens. The separation of powers, there are boundaries that are managed uh, that each of the arms of the state must uh, uh, deal with. The courts will say, um, we find that there is a problem in this legislation as has been brought to our attention, but it is not for us to make uh, that uh, piece of legis correct. The legislature will sort it out. They will be given 18 months, for example, so that they determine what the law will, will say and so on. The courts interpret the law. 
This is why they'll say, no, in this instance, parliament was justified in using its rules because otherwise the disruption would prevent its business from not taking place. So that, that respect is expressed that way uh, and understood uh, in the separation of power. The involvement of the army, the police, the security services uh, as a cluster as a whole is part of that uh, expression and so on. They do not run the affairs uh, during our sittings. That's the presiding officer's responsibility and so on. And the boundaries have been explained and clarified as has been indicated here. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, on the movement of the media, I think that has been explained in addition to what had already been uh, conveyed through interaction with the Secretary to Parliament, that uh, we do not anticipate uh, media personnel to be stopped all over the place and harassment uh, of media, uh, of journalists in them execu executing their job. We really don't expect that at all because it indeed is a normal process that all of us gather here and we each play our roles in the usual ways. And, and, and therefore, it's not, in fact, even in the interest of parliament for journalists to be, uh, to feel that they are accosted or they are stopped from moving around in the usual manner, you know, to, in order for them to, to do their job. Yes, uh, I did receive correspondence from the EFF uh, and I responded to it. I've become aware today maybe two hours ago, that there's further correspondence which is uh, being attended to as we speak. Just to add on the protection of the president, I think I, I want to underline what the chairperson is saying and to say that indeed we will continuously leave no stone unturned in ensuring that everything is done for the decorum of the House of Parliament uh, to be respected in order that all of us must deliver uh, uh, to the mandate given by the people of South Africa. And so from our side as presiding officers, we will utilize all the rules and make sure that we maintain the decorum in order that parliament can do its job. I think we've covered all the questions. Thank you so much, Speaker. The, I'm only taking two hands that I closed after acknowledging or recognizing them. Sorry, I don't think the question on uh, the numbers regarding to no, SAPs remember, was remember answered. No, remember, I said that matter, we're going to take it on a bilateral basis, aside. Or the I had asked a question in terms of the appropriate law uh, on the express permission required by the presiding officers. How much, what express permission have the presiding officers given in terms of numbers of SAPs, numbers of defense, numbers of SSA people to be allowed to be operating on this permit that the presiding officers are by law exclusively in charge of? Thank you. Such a question would require that you pose it to the members who exercise executive authority over the various uh, groupings of security forces that you are, you are mentioning. Here in Parliament, we've got the Parliamentary Protection Services. We do have the regular members of the South African uh, police uh, forces that work around the precinct. So there is nothing else that has been uh, 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 agreed to by us. We've been informed by the president. 
of the members of the South African National Defense Force who are going to be in the appropriate places awaiting an occasion should there be a need for them to come and support the South African uh, police services. And uh, things will proceed as they usually do. And we never even really get conscious of the presence anywhere around of the members of, of the South African National Defense Force. And so we expect that tomorrow uh, things will go on as normal. And somebody asked the question of whether there was ever any need in our view that uh, perhaps there be members of, of the security forces. And I do want to say that there was a year, if it's not last year, it was a year before, when outside the precincts of parliament, there were physical fights, including stabbings of people out there. Uh, so we, 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 we really don't know and we were not uh, observers uh, in those incidents, but we know that there were acts of criminality outside the precincts of parliament. And I'm quite sure that those that considered the capacity needed to make sure that any eventuality can be managed would have taken into account such uh, 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 previous events and, 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 and the potential of similar uh, 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 complications coming about and saying that there ought to be people with appropriate skills uh, to assist. Thank you, Speaker. We are only taking the last three that I've noted now because Babalo has also raised a hand. We're taking Paul and Gay and uh, Babalo. Good evening, um, Speaker and Chairperson. Uh, Paul Vecchiata from Bloomberg and Secretary of the Parliamentary Press Gallery Association. Uh, just to go back to media freedom, and I, first of all, I welcome the statement that journalists will uh, be able to move freely. But just to get uh, um, a little bit of specific clarity, um, can you assure us that we'll have free access to our offices in 100 Plain Street and Marks Building in particular before, during, and after the State of the Nation address. And then uh, uh, just something to touch on to on the speaker's ball, and that, and it's just an understanding of what happens after the Sona, if you don't mind. The um, president will be going to address the People's Assembly down in Grand Parade uh, as soon as he's finished the speech. I just want to understand, will he also be at, uh, making an appearance at the ball? Um, from what I heard from last year, a lot of your guests were really impressed by your hospitality there. And then um, secondly, will you and the chairperson also be making an appearance at Grand Parade for the People's Assembly? Thank you. Thanks, it's Gay here again. Um, Madam Chairperson, um, I just wanted to be sure that I heard correctly because you said that the president was here not just as the president of the country but as the head of all three arms of the state. I, I heard correctly, did I? But he's not head of all three arms of state. He's head of the executive. Is that not right? Okay. I'll just move on from that. Um, the other, the other question that I just wanted to ask you is, are you satisfied that all the legal requirements relating to the deployment of the SANDF members were met? I noticed that we've got the ATC today, but the deployment was since Sunday the 5th. Um, and there's a question mark over whether it was gazetted in terms of the Defence Act. I don't know whether that was there. Um, if you could confirm that those I's were dotted and T's were crossed and that you, you're completely satisfied. Thanks. Bye. Babalo is the last one. Oh, gone. Okay, thank you. Residing officers. Um, all the legal requirements 
for the deployment of SEPs. When we get notification, when the president signs off a letter, it doesn't automatically mean that we are going to receive the letter on that date. And when we ATC, we ATC as soon as it is possible. Now, if the letter comes to parliament during the weekend, the ATC machinery has not, is not there. So you would wait for the next available uh, date so that you can then ATC. And I think that is what happened because I only became aware of the letter the president has sent to my office over the weekend. There's no way we could have ATC'd over the weekend. So we did it within the reasonable time that we could do it. I, again, I, I suspect the issues about access of journalists to their offices seems a little bit strange for me, but I think the secretary might be able to clarify this. It should be natural that journalists would have access to their offices uh, without any hindrance. And, 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 and perhaps I, it is because I do not understand what is really at issue. Whether, in fact, you are saying that parliament is so restricting your movements that we are saying you cannot go to your offices. And if that is the case, then we want to pay for but apologize to the speaker because that is not the intention. What we would want is a media which feels comfortable to report without fear or favor, which reflects and educates. That is what we would want to see. Parliament has absolutely no appetite to intimidate or to, to uh, prohibit people from doing their ordinary business. That is not our intention. Speaker, about the ball, I don't know. I do know that... Uh, um, I certainly would not mind going to the speaker's ball. Um, we will be tired. It will be time to drink something and to listen to good music. And I certainly will avail myself to that. Will I be able to do the parade and the speaker's ball? I don't know. I have to decide which one comes first. But I can tell you that uh, it is not an... I don't think we are forced to make the choices. I am not sure whether um, the speaker has invited the president or the president invites himself. He goes with a big contingent. If the contingent says it is f fine for him to address and then come and join the speaker at the ball, there shouldn't be any issue about it, actually. A ball is a ball. It's people coming together, eating something, and then going home. <laughs> Depends. Uh, the access to offices has been answered. Surely can be an issue. On the president being the head of the national executive, he, the constitution actually says he's a head of state, which includes the three arms. The state includes the three arms. So his role includes that role. And then also the head of this one, the executive. So he's both. He's both the head of the national executive as well as the whole state. That includes all three arms. So I think those are the only issues that still needed to be addressed. I think at this point we should thank everybody else who has been here and uh, we thank the leadership and uh, we are also hoping that uh, whether directly or indirectly we will find ourselves into the ball of the speaker. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay.
uh, I just want to sensitize members of the media and our guests that some refreshments have been prepared at the dining hall. Thank you so much. Thanks.